Um, today we're going to cover three main things. Uh, Ethereum scaling solutions, going through the history, going through the path it's been taking, the Flow blockchain, what we've been doing in this time and what we've been building, and then our new uh, EVM on Flow uh, release and what's coming up with that and the opportunities that anyone's been building with Ethereum now gets by simply moving or, or adding Flow to their application. So we'll start off with the history of Ethereum scaling solutions. Um, Real quick moment of 2015, Ethereum launched a revolutionary way to have programmable uh, internet and programmable money. Um, 2016, it had, uh, I lost it, the, the DAO launched in 2016. Uh, the DAO was the, the first uh, decentralized autonomous organization. Um, in 2016, they launched, they had about 18,000 18, users and ended up having a DAO hack and a, and a major uh, scalability issue arose through people trying to get their money out before the hackers actually could extract their money. If anyone remembers exactly what happened there, the hackers could take half of the funds of the DAO continuously over and over again. So people that were members of the DAO just kind of watched their money drain while they're trying to race and get their money out at the same time. So there was a massive amount of usage on the network and people trying to race to uh, escape the hack effectively. Um, then 2017, CryptoKitties launched. Um, CryptoKitties was a cat breeding game. Um, many people that loved the game and, and we ended up having a significant amount of users and eating up a significant amount of the Ethereum block space. There was a lot of frustration. You can actually go back in time and people were launching ICOs at that time and many people were having to delay their ICO because of how much block space CryptoKitties was taking up. And uh, there's, like I said, major frustration of that. Through this timeline, um, sharding was the solution that many were people talking about for Ethereum. Sharding is effectively taking pieces of data and scaling it across different nodes. Um, later, the next cycle comes, 2022. The other side mint for other deeds happens. Many people try to mint these deeds. I think there was a lot of uh, retro on the contract itself of how efficient it was with gas, but people remember again, effectively taking down the Ethereum network during this time, and it was not necessarily able to take on that amount of traffic. And that was roughly the same time that uh, Ethereum shift from necessarily sharding to scale to this layer two path to scale. So let's quickly talk about uh, Ethereum scaling solutions. So there is the sharding path in the layer twos, and this is just at least how I visualize it. Um, sharding, there's effectively a beacon chain layer with many shards. You can see it goes from shard one to shard 64, breaking up these pieces of data and submitting blobs to the beacon chain. The benefit of this is you can scale natively within the Ethereum protocol while maintaining your decentralization at its core of Ethereum. The, the difficulty of this and why they ended up moving away from this solution is it's, it's actually very complex for the protocol to implement this. And especially for Ethereum, which is out there running on thousands of nodes, the sophistication that they would have to do to iteratively scale this out was a big, massive task to take on while there were other issues that they wanted to do moving from proof of work to proof of stake, other challenges that they were trying to tackle within Ethereum. So they introduced this new path of layer twos. And really what it does is it's a similar solution. You can see almost these shards are almost acting as layer twos now in this image, but there's a slight difference there that I think is very important for us to talk about. Um, the benefits from, from the Ethereum builder's point of view is it's the ease of protocol implementation. Most of what layer twos needed is kind of available on, uh, on Ethereum. There's small increments, small tweaks. You're just submitting blobs, verifying them if they're ZK or trusting for verifiers to come later on if it's optimistic. Um, and there's flexibility of implementation. It kind of really opened up the door for many people to experiment and try different things with layer twos, try different ways that they felt like they could build out these layer twos and really le left the decision to those builders themselves. The downside of this is, again, as we can see, there's, there's ecosystem fragmentation. I know many people have walked around the conference this, this year. Um, layer twos have absolutely exploded. There's many different solutions, many things to choose from, and then also adding additional complexity of now there's sequencers and data availability layers and all of these choices that a developer and a user has to decide on where they want to build and where they want to grow. Um, there's a broken user experience. I, it, it might be as simple as clicking and adding a network, but there's many different networks and many, not as a main way to know which network you're talking to where. Um, and then it's a complex developer experience. Developer has to not only select which layer two they want to go to, which developer platform they want to use, which sequencer they want to use, and what those functions and applications that they want to compose with are where. And it's, it ends up being a very difficult problem for, for developers to make the selection that they think is best for their application. So many end up going multi-chain, not necessarily making a dedicated selection and going across all of these layer twos, which then just adds that user complexity and the user confusion. Um, quickly want to talk about uh, intro to Flow, Flow blockchain. This is, this is what Flow Foundation has been working on. This is what Dapper Labs has been uh, initially built. 
um, and what their focus is. So Flow is a layer one blockchain for consumer applications focused on scaling to a billion apps, uh, billion users. It was built by the, it was founded by the builders over at Dapper Labs, again, who initially made CryptoKitties, who we talked about before, but has since been building NBA Top Shot, Disney Pinnacle, NFL all day. And these applications are made for consumers to have brands that they love and be introduced to Web3 in ways that are familiar, whether that's using the Dapper wallet, the same embedded wallet app experience that we were talking about with Privy, or using credit card rails to on and off ramp and it'll really let them feel comfortable in engaging with these digital assets. Um, on the right here, you'll see a lot of the brands that run Dapper, Dapper, are on Flow blockchain today, whether that is Mattel doing Barbie or at Hot Wheels drops, or whether that is Disney with our friends over at Cryptoys selling Disney figurines that can operate in a metaverse, or whether that is Dapper with NBA Top Shot and NFL All Day selling sports moments with sports collectibles. Um, we also have a thriving ecosystem of uh, DeFi, whether that is through e Increment Fi or we have an educational and, and uh, DAO platform through Emerald City, or we have NFT Fi through Floaty with marketplaces and loans using those NBA top shots to take out a loan. Um, let's talk about how Flow looks at scaling real quick here. So how Flow looks at scaling is we wanted to ensure that you could scale seamlessly without sacrificing and decentralization. And one of the, one of the things I realized this, this morning when I was thinking through this talk was, uh, if you look at it differently from how Ethereum scaled through its data model or its database by sharding data, splitting it up and, and scattering across different nodes, Flow looked at how it could scale almost more like a processor. It took individual tasks and broke those up and gave dedicated portions over those tasks, right? So you look at our collection and our consensus nodes, this is effectively ways you can build blocks and form consensus of what node should be next in the block or what node has happened in the past building the chain itself, removing the, the ability for MEV extraction because we have proposer of the block and builder of the block separated natively. Um, we're also horizontally scalable. So for, for Flow, every single execution node that you add, you add to its throughput. They can parallelize transactions through this and you can actually add more and more transactions natively on Flow. These are like the high processing cores of a, of a CPU, right? And we're not necessarily losing out on our consensus or our decentralization. For every single consensus node you add, you add decentralization of the network itself without necessarily limiting your throughput, without necessarily having to forego and lower the requirements for the node itself to process these transactions fastly. Um, so if you look at the Ethereum typical standards, you'll, you'll see data availability layers, sequencing layers, execution layers, and settlement layers. I, I translated that to effectively how Flow sees this with its multi-node architecture, all in, integrated, all embedded with the protocol itself, whether that be through access nodes, which you can run as a developer, have ingress and egress to the network, have all of the data available for you, you can run scripts on that and query the data all at the edge so it happens very fast for developers and they're not necessarily reliant on the rest of the network's ability to keep up. You have sequencing through collection and consensus nodes. You have execution, like I mentioned, through the very well-named execution nodes. And you have settlement uh, through our verification and consensus nodes. Uh, so let's look at the differences here of the layer two solution that Ethereum is going down versus the integrated multi-node solution that Flow is going down. So it's a similar pro and con list, but the, the images here, I think, are exactly what articulates what I'm, what I'm getting at. For every single layer two that's added, it might have different applications that you can play with or functionality that you can use. So one might have a really good randomizer or one might have an application that you wanna compose on top of or one might have uh, an embedded wallet that you wanna use. And as an app developer, you have to sacrifice almost to pick which of these you want to do. And you also have to select a network that you think can actually handle you when you scale and hope that when you scale, you don't overwhelm that network and have to find a new home like many people are having to go through today. Flow, on the other hand, it has those similar primitives, but instead of you having to make compromises or make selections of which execution you want to use, it's fully integrated. It operates as a full VM for anyone to use and leverage. So if an, app, if an application runs on Flow, you don't have to know which execution node are you on. It's all across all of our execution nodes. You can use that same code, that same ability you can pose on top very simply, very directly. Um, so I wanted to kind of articulate the size and scale of, of where we've, we've seen Ethereum communities and where we've seen Flow communities and where we can go. Um, one of, one of, Matt uh, mentioned a really good way to do this is almost connected to subreddits and subreddit communities. So um, the DAO hack, as I was mentioning before, at its time of hack and when it was seeing these massive scalability issues, it was at roughly 18,000 users at, at time of hack. 
the same size as the polydactyl Reddit. So hopefully we learn about some fun Reddits today as well. At least we can take that away. So polydactyl community is of kids that have kittens that have extra dig dat digits. So if a cat has six fingers, that's the community that shares photos of these cats. It's very cute. You can go check it out. It's a fun one. Um, the other deeds, so that, that, that scalability issue that ran into in 2022, is the same size as the firewood community on Reddit. So these are people that are talking about chopping, stacking, and racking firewood, how to do that most effectively and efficiently. There's some interesting pictures there for people that want to join that community. Yugo Labs as a whole, who has acquired, whether it be CryptoPunks or the Proof Collective, all of their holders in total are 50,000 holders. And that's the same size as the instant ramen community uh, in Reddit. So this is people that talk about how you can best prepare instant ramen, a little pro tip if anyone's interested. You can check out how you can build, bake the best instant ramen using the microwave or the stove or whoever you prefer. Um, and then CryptoKitties, who I mentioned before, at that time of 2017 when it was growing and, and causing these massive uh, scalability, scalability issues on Ethereum, when people were having to move their ICOs back and very frustrated, it was at roughly 70,000 holders, which is the same size as the grandma's pantry uh, Reddit community. This is people that take interesting pictures of what's inside their grandparents' pantry. There's very funny things that are found inside of these pantries. Um, let's, let's, co let's compare this to the, the flow size and the flow community. We launched roughly in 2020. You'll see a lot of these applications came live in 2022. But fan craze is about India cricket community. And so these are India cricket sport moments. You can go buy and collect these. It's a massive, massive brand for, for India. There's about 80,000 holders there. It's the same size as the animal memes community. So you get these fun animal memes, this nice aggregation of different things you might see across Reddit. The NFL all day community is at about roughly 85 and a half thousand holders today. Same size as the people that love to talk and share memes about the Office TV show. I think it's mostly the American version, but there's probably some British version snuck in there as well. And then the NBA Top Shot community uh, is roughly 708,000 holders, people that own and hold NBA Top Shot moments. And this is the same size as the Xbox subreddit itself. And so as you can see, we're, we're going through, we're hitting more, much more of these larger and larger communities, and we want to be able to achieve these large scale communities. And then lastly, one that, that isn't touted as much as I think it should be is the Ticketmaster uh, application that runs on Flow. So if you go to a Ticketmaster event, many Ticketmaster events will send you an email after the event and say, we're really happy you enjoyed this event. Here's a commemorative NFT collectible that you can have. and actually shows your ticket, where you sat, what event you went to, and a nice little photo of it. Um, Ticketmaster today has issued 71 million NFTs on Flow and it has 10 million holders and accounts that have collected these NFTs on Flow. And that's roughly the size of r slash travel. And just to articulate that as well, we, they, they went to about 100 N, uh, NFL games last year and did this. And an NFL stadium is roughly 50 to 80,000 people that will get onboarded to Flow at that one moment at that one event. Uh, actually, I do want to, and just to kind of lay this as well, the Ticketmaster, there's 10 million holders today, but to look at the subreddit community just for the NBA itself, that's roughly 12 million people. So you, as you can see, we have these, these large communities, but Flow is looking to scale larger and larger to hit these mainstream communities and have developers, have a protocol that grows with developers and grows with the community's success itself. So Flow wants to engage these large communities while remaining fully decentralized, adding consensus nodes, and it's built to grow with the success of those communities. So while we're trying to engage the masses, we don't want to necessarily lose the Web3 principles that brought us all here today, whether that's interoperability, composability, and decentralization, but we need to make sure we're fast and able to handle the throughput of these large communities. So removing constraint from builders, removing that selection, and removing that complexity, scaling applications with their success without them having to go, I'm, now that I'm successful on this layer one, I'm going to build a layer two. Now that I'm successful on this layer two, I'm going to build a layer three. They just work with the protocol itself, build an incredible application, and do not have to worry about the infrastructure itself. Um, just to share some numbers, Flow today, where roughly 600 million transactions have been processed on Flow, there's roughly 45 million active accounts on Flow, 440 nodes running and securing the network, and that is spread across 20 countries. And there's a nice little graphic of the map. We're working on further uh, regional decentralization and working with uh, different operators and communities to run those nodes natively within their region. Um, the most exciting thing I think that's happening with Flow, so as we talk about the scalability and the opportunity of building on Flow, um, previously it was an issue that we had to learn, reinvent yourself when it's coming to Flow. You had to learn Cadence and you had to learn the Flow API, but with EVM on Flow, we're becoming fully EVM equivalent, and those EVM, geth, effectively the geth protocol, run or the geth 
binary runs on our execution nodes and gets all of the benefits of running on EVM. So what does that mean for you? Do you get faster, cheaper, and more transactions? So it's not about necessarily just speed and cost, but you can actually do a lot more using EVM on Flow. You can deploy on Flow simply, easily, without any code changes, or you can just simply add Flow support as if it's any other EVM equivalent chain. It is fully EVM equivalent. It's not trying to play a little uh, show saying we're EVM compatible and then as you dive deeper, you realize there's all these differences, whether it is in Solidity Smart Contract or it's not compatible and inbound down. We are fully EVM equivalent. Whatever you run Solidity code, you can run that on Flow's EVM. Whatever APIs you use of that JSON RPC layer, you can use that and run it on Flow today. Um, and you get to scale at the protocol level. Again, it's, it's not necessarily the EVM itself that's struggling with scalability. It is the protocols and the ability to remain decentralized that are running, running into these issues. So I have the nice little graphic over here, the Solidity code. You can click add outflow on the other side. Or if you look at a platform like an Alchemy or a Privy that we heard from earlier, you can simply add Flow's RPC and you'd be running natively. Um, now that's, that, that not only can you do faster, cheaper, and more like many other EVM equivalent L2s or L1s, um, we actually have the ability for you to elevate your application using Flow as well. So we have this uh, cadence layer that you can tap into and leverage to just add wrappers and incrementally grow and build your application. We have a transaction model that I think is very helpful for builders to build consumer grade applications. You can have the proposer that allows for you to submit as many app transactions that you want for the same account at the same time and Flow will process those in parallel for you. So uh, if you go to NBA Top Shot today, you can actually click buy, 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 buy and all of those buys are being processed by the blockchain at the same exact time. So you don't necessarily have to wait and feel the, the speed of the blockchain, you can click click, click, and keep moving. Uh, you have Payer, which is natively integrated with the Flow protocol itself. So any uh, account can sign for the transaction and say, I will pay for this transaction. So that could be the application, that could be the wallet, or that could be yourself if you, if you don't want to be bound to any of those things. And then there's also an authorizer role, which allows for many accounts to sign the same transaction. So you can do more and more sophisticated things with the transaction itself. Um, not only do those roles expose these incredible hooks for developers to play with, but you can have fully scriptable interactions as well. So our transactions are more than just a function call or a list of function calls with bundled transactions, but there's pre and post conditions, and then there's a fully programmable execution logic. So to, to double click on that, you can have a precondition to check, is the state looking the way I expect it to be? Here's the functions I want you to run with if statements and for loops. And then here's the state that I expect after I ran, you ran that function. And if the precondition or post condition do not pass, you actually ex you do not execute that transaction. It cancels out and does not get sealed on the blockchain itself. So it allows for very interesting DeFi activities. I, I think we've seen uh, people come in and actually run through liquidity pools and like trying to flop tokens to see if they can make some money and their little post condition at the end is, did I make any money? If not, don't, don't do that. I don't want to do that anymore. And so there's these very thriving ecosystems that can leverage the sophisticated application. Um, additionally, there's our account model that, that allows for native account abstraction. So you can have accounts are decoupled from the external keys that they themselves. So every account acts as a smart account. So you can have multi-signature accounts. You can have n number of keys with n number of weights. So you can require three keys to sign or you can require five keys to sign for any account to do any action. And additionally, we have native secure enclave and key store support. So we support those cryptographic curves that you can have directly within the protocol without having to rely on a bundler's support or rely on bundler infrastructure. Additionally, with EVM on Flow, there's, there's a new resource that we're introducing called Cadence Owned Accounts. And this is effectively allowing for Cadence to operate and own an account within the EVM side. So Cadence now can have code that interoperates with EVM code and you can actually run applications as EVM code if you wanted to. And so that, that asset, that Cadence owned account is actually a full blown resource or NFT within Flow and you can actually trade, share, take loans out on these assets or even delegate access to those NFTs as well. So you could have this uh, nested connection for an EVM, or an EVM application to benefit from the account model itself. Um, Additionally, you could elevate your application, so not just by leveraging our transaction or account model, but you actually write cadence smart contracts and have those operate as wrappers around your EVM code as well. And so if there's EVM code that you've been running and you love or someone else has been running and you're like, I just wanna do that exact same thing over here, you can take that Solidity code, deploy it on Flow EVM and then actually write some cadence code that maybe improves it 
an interesting way or achieves things that you could not necessarily achieve directly within Cadence. And what are some of those things? Cadence is a resource-oriented programming language. So that gets all these benefits of assets acting as full resources and not just JSON blobs of metadata. So ownership of flow is very direct and not necessarily something you have to look into for like message.sender when you're developing on Solidity. You can actually see who owns this asset and look within their account itself. Um, Cadence with EVM on Flow has those Cadence owns accounts, which I mentioned all the benefits in the last slide, also allows for assets to move across. So we have a cross VM connectivity that allows for you to take an NFT on the Cadence side, move it over to the Solidity side and potentially solicit it on a Solidity marketplace. So this could be top shots minted in Cadence going on to OpenSea or Magic Eden that operate on EVM or vice versa. This could be an EVM asset, whether that is a fungible token or non-fungible token, coming over to Cadence and benefiting from acting as a fully blown resource on the Cadence programming language. Um, additionally, you can have a more sophisticated logic and expand, uh, you could share logic in this way by expanding your Solidity smart contract using Cadence. So you're super powering these EVM apps is how I look at it, right? You're taking, you're taking what was and not having to reinvent and rebuild, but you're able to add on top and make it incredibly different. And then composability in lot and life with assets is incredible, and that's what Web3 has been building off of and, and very excited about. But with Cadence, you can have composability of logic. And how I look at this is very much like the open source uh, movement in, in node package modules. So now we can see much more modular code be deployed in Cadence, and you can actually import that code and leverage it within your experience. So for example here, let's say you wanted to compose with NBA Top Shot, you could actually do flow, dot, flow dependencies add mainnet slash Top shot mainnet address dot top shot. And we have an awesome website called Contract Browser. Go to contractbrowser.com. You can, you can search all of the contracts that exist on Flow. You can see all of the contracts that exist on Flow, and then you can import them to your application just with this simple function right here. So compose, build, add, and it's, it's not just for assets, but for actions as well. Um, Coolest part about this is this isn't something that's coming in years. This isn't something that we're talking about will be happening anytime soon. This is available today on our preview net. Um, this is some of the endpoints. So like I mentioned, you can talk to our, our Cadence API or you can talk to our EVM JSON RPC endpoint. Here's all the parameters you need to add in. We have a block explorer that you can see EVM or if you use the block explorer with Cadence, you can actually see the nested EVM block explorer as well. And so now we're, we're having working with developers, lifting and shifting and moving over to our EVM space and expanding that with their Cadence application. So the four things I want to, to have everyone walk away with here today is now with Flow, you can simply run on Flow using your Ethereum application. No need, need to re reinvent yourself, rebuild yourself, reimagine what's possible. You can elevate your application using the account and transaction models with Cadence. You're gonna have faster, cheaper, and more transactions with its natively scalable protocol itself and not having to reinvent yourself or become an L2, L3, L4 provider itself. Um, and you're able to use EVM on Flow today. So, there's our developer docs, developers.flow.com slash EVM slash using, or the QR code is always the, the nicest way to do that. Um, EVM on Flow is connected to our Crescendo upgrade. So as you hear, if you follow us on Twitter, you'll hear us talk about Crescendo, you'll hear us talk about EVM on Flow. Those things are, EVM on Flow is enabled by Crescendo itself. So um, thank you for everyone for, for listening to my, my quick presentation here. Follow us on Flow Blockchain.